Welcome to part two of the TechSage webinar focused on Disability 101 for researchers, taking a closer look at communication. Part two will focus on exploring attitudinal barriers and defining people first and value laden language. There are some common ways that folks with disabilities are viewed and treated, and unfortunately, we still see these today. Um, we see them in culture today. Uh, and I think a lot of it uh, does come from media, and I'm not going to sit here and blame the media, mm -hmm. but I think that a lot of it, um, you know, it, it comes from any number of sources and, and the way that uh, folks are to be looked at. A lot of this is really inaccurate. Uh, I believe that I should not define your experience and you should not define my experience. And so um, these are some ways that folks with disabilities have been viewed. I've seen these even in the last week, you know, as a victim or an object of pity, um, horrible or grotesque. And I, I saw that just the other day. Somebody was like, oh, they're so horrible. Um, burdens, uh, you know, oh, they're not paying taxes and grouping everybody into this, you know, category. Um, they're either a burden on their families or caregivers or, you know, carers or society. Um, evil, uh, and I believe it or not, when I was doing some uh, travel in some other countries um, with my daughter who has cerebral palsy, um, there were people that actually were like, gosh, I wonder what she did wrong. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> she didn't do anything wrong. Um, but a threat, uh, we see this a lot with uh, some folks that have mental health issues, um, you know, a threat to safety. Um, unable or, or un, you know, assumed unable to do things. Uh, and I've seen that where people jump to help somebody um, maybe too quickly uh, instead of saying, gosh, you know, I think you could do it. So we don't want to teach learned helplessness, if you will. Um, or having multiple disabilities. And um, mm -hmm. do you want to talk about this one for a second? Yeah, um, I could go on for days about this, but it's so interesting how when somebody... Um, sees me or sees a friend of mine or a coworker that uses uh, a mobility aid, a power wheelchair, manual wheelchair, walker, cane, crutch, whatever, and they just assume that there's some intellectual disability happening there as well. And so they don't talk to them as the professional that they are or just as the grown adult that they are or just treat them with respect. So there's always that idea that if somebody has one disability, then I guess they've got to have um, a yeah. handful, you know, of basketball, if you will. So, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, and I've actually, I was, uh, believe it or not, I was in a, um, a research meeting and somebody there knew that I had um, learning disabilities and they kept stopping and reading everything really loudly um, to me and I was like, I'm fine. You know, I've already listened to all this and you don't have to do that. But I was like, I, why are they doing that? You know, is it because they think I have an intellectual disability? That, or do they think that I have, uh, I'm, de you know, deaf or have hearing-related disabilities? Or maybe I do. Maybe I need to get my ears checked. <laughs> you know, so it made me start questioning, you know, <laughs> myself. Um, we also see that people would be treated childlike. Um, you know, that not taken seriously. I, and I've seen this with folks, especially as they age into disability. Um, you know, a lot of times people with developmental disabilities, they might have Down syndrome or what have you, and they're not treated as somebody who has um, sexual desires or who have uh, an, an idea as to what's going on in current events or um, that they might want to do something that's more age appropriate. And instead, you know, there's this idea of keeping them childlike. And then this term, um, special, uh, we hear that all the time. And I've actually had people say, gosh, Carolyn, you're so special. And I'm like, you're special too. And they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I'm like, well, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> if it's offensive to call you special, why can't, you know, what's mm -hmm. that about? So, um, or, you know, exceptional, uh, you know, things like that. Lots of misconceptions, and they're based on insufficient or inaccurate information. Uh, and it really does perpetuate that, you know, the, the continued ideas of victim and all of that. So um, we want to, the main idea here is no assumptions. So don't make that, that assumption. Really, we want to look at these attitudinal barriers um, and help kind of break those down. And we're going to give you some tools to, to help you with that. Um, we find that, you know, we face uh, barriers every day. Mm -hmm. People with disabilities face barriers every day. Um, I asked Liz to uh, represent our organization at an event, and sure enough, we found out that the stage is not accessible, which is ridiculous. And, um, but she's the spokesperson that I wanted to, to do the talk for us, and, and that's ridiculous. So um, all of a sudden, 
uh, that becomes the issue instead of the importance of the content of what we're trying to express. So what we find is that um, that's got to change, and we've got to come up with ways to do that. Um, there are also systematic barriers um, that are in employment and civic programs. Uh, and we often find that it's attitudes. It's attitudes. It's not necessarily that physical barrier. The physical barrier may represent mm -hmm. an attitudinal barrier. Um, for example, we were doing some work in faith communities, and I got into a hot debate with a minister who did not feel like that the um, pulpit needed to be wheelchair accessible because they're like, well, those people don't ever come up here and preach. And I'm like, first of all, those people. Um, second of all, you know, what is, who knows, you may end up in a wheelchair, and he's like, don't say that. And I was like, <laughs> well, I'm telling you. And then sure enough, no joke, three weeks later, the um, person who was the choir director ended up having to use a wheelchair chair, and now it's accessible. So, so there you go. Um, you know, whether it's born from ignorance, fear, misunderstanding, you know, it could be hate. Um, you know, the attitudes from folks uh, that, you know, keeps people from appreciating each other, um, it really does hold people back, and we want to make sure that we can uh, be stewards of, of goodwill and helping people understand. So there are these air attitudinal barriers, and we put these up here because we want you to be able to reference them later, but we'll see things like this inferiority, like, oh, second-class citizen, or gosh, it's so nice that you have a job, or, or what have you. Pity. Um, I was working with a student the other day who is doing some research and was talking about um, that they don't feel comfortable around people with disabilities because they feel sorry for them. And I'm like, you've got to get over that real quick because that's not going to get you very far. And your research is going to probably be slanted, you know, if that's your attitude. And it was good to have that healthy dialogue about that and we got to, you know, kind of where the root of where that was coming from. Hero worship is the other thing that we see where people are like, oh my gosh, you're awesome, you're the best because you read that form. And I'm like, I am great, you read the form too, you're a hero also. Um, you know, but this idea of you're so brave, and I know you've heard some of that too, you're so brave for being dressed and wheeling around the office, right? So, you know, but that, that you know, flip side of uh, hero worship. And a lot of times it is that ignorance or the assumptions that are made. Um, a lot of people, for example, are surprised when people with quadriplegia can drive or have kids, and they're like, are these really your children? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're really my children. How did that really happen? Um, or when people that are blind can tell the time, believe it or not, or that they're interested in going to the movies. Um, people that are deaf that you know can play sports and, and really enjoy music. Um, you know, I, I have a friend of mine who's deaf that um, loves to go to concerts, and it's more the energy of the people, and I think that's very cool. Um, and people with developmental disabilities, you know, that they, they you know, um, aren't creative necessarily, supposedly, and those are all ignorant um, assumptions. Mm -hmm. And then the spread effect, you know, that, oh gosh, you know, there's something, you know, it's going to be uh, contagious, or, you know, this idea that it can go from... Uh, one place to the other. So paying attention to those things. Stereotypes, we know this. I know you know this. Um, just don't stereotype. Uh, a lot of times people try to do that. They make these big, bold as assumptions. My dyslexia is very different than uh, somebody else who might have dyslexia. Um, you meet one person who is blind or ha you know, a person who has some visual impairment. You've met one person who has some visual impairment. It's not um, something that you can necessarily make you know, these sweeping generalizations about. So um, be mindful of those stereotypes and try and not to do that. Um, and then sometimes we see this. Uh, we're very excited um, that <clears throat> the ADA is uh, going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary in 2015. Uh, we're very, very excited about that. Um, but there are folks that, um, you know, have seen some backlash because of some of the ADA. I was listening on NPR today and there was a story about that. And so um, just being mindful of, you know, the backlash effect too. There are, um, you know, there's, there are folks that, you know, assume um, at, with, the, you know, oh, so-and-so is in denial, um, you know, because a lot of disabilities are hidden and, and we know that. Uh, so being mindful that not everybody's going to be uh, totally open about that, but if we create Thinking about that universal design principles that we first started, you know, uh, this talk out with, 
Um, if we create environments where everybody can be successful, then we are doing a really good job with folks who have all types of abilities, including hidden disabilities. So, um, and then fear. Uh, there are folks that I meet, and the woman that I was talking about who had the pity factor going on, she also had fear. Um, she was like, oh no, you know, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? And I'm like, be bold. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Um, don't have that fear factor. Uh, you know, and, and if you do, let's talk about it. So we're going to jump into tips for breaking down these barriers. We're going to touch on the power of language, value-laden language. We're going to give examples of disability negative versus disability neutral language. Um, tips for interacting with people with disabilities. And then we're just going to touch a little bit about assistive technology. And we've shared some of that um, earlier as well. So language is unbelievably powerful. Um, the truth is, is language is continually evolving, and that really relates to language um, for people with disabilities. Um, staying current is important, but it's not to show that you're being politically correct. You know, I always say if we were worried about being politically correct all the time, like really truly worried about it, I don't think we would ever talk to anybody because we'd be so afraid of saying something that would offend someone. Um, but the important thing to remember is to communicate effectively and with respect. Um, and we love this quote. Um, Carolyn um, introduced me to this years ago, and it really puts it into perspective. And it's from Mark Twain, and it says, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. So I don't know about y'all out there, but I would rather have a little lightning bug land on me as opposed to being struck by lightning. Yes. I, uh, I really do appreciate this concept of value-laden language. And I want you to think about this. I was introduced to this 26 years ago um, when I took my very first psychology course. And I, I really have used this throughout my career. And I think about this as I'm writing brochures, as I'm writing um, you know, any kind of uh, IRB you know, submission, as I'm doing anything when it comes to writing articles. Um, and I think about what is what is my language saying? If I, I might, you know, just write something down. But it, what is my language conveying? Um, it does say a lot. The words you use say a lot about who you are and what your values are. Um, what our values are here, you know, in at Tools for Life at AMAC and Georgia Tech. Um, and so, being mindful of that. Uh, all everybody should be sensitive to language um, when you're referring to uh, customers. Um, when you're, you know, when you're thinking about those things, it's it is about HIPAA and FERPA and those laws and those regulations. But it's also about dignity, right? So <clears throat> when we refer to a condition instead of a person, we devalue that person. Um, and an example of that is you know if somebody and I've actually had somebody say oh Carolyn is a dyslexic and I was like am I a dyslexic what is that a dyslexic um, and but but you know the the way to say that would really be Carolyn has learning disabilities she's Carolyn first and then she's got this other thing um, it was interesting because I talk about Liz all the time um, she and I've worked together for well over 13 years now I think and um, but I talk about her all the time and uh, some people in my family, um, they saw pictures of her because she just got married and I was showing pictures everywhere. And uh, one of my cousins said, oh my gosh, you know, I've heard you talk about her for 10 years. I had no idea that she um, uses a wheelchair. And I was like, well, I don't even know why we would have talked about that. Like, why would that have come up? Um, and I really was like, okay. You know, and, and, and I thought it was interesting because it was the first thing she noticed, but it was not ever anything that I would have used as a defining factor for Liz, right? Because Liz is awesome on, a, on so many levels. And I can say that because I know her. Um, <clears throat> person first language is what we want to think about. So you're talking about the person first and then the whatever it is, condition, you know, uh, illness, whatever it is, second. We're going to give you tangible examples of that. So, um, and we've got some more we want you to think about. Um, so it may not be visible, as Carolyn mentioned. Um, the disability may be temporary, um, and again, some per, you know some people may have more than one disability. Um, 
when we are working with other programs. It could be the staff member that has the disability. Um, either way, the person is not his or her disability. It's not something that should define, define them 100%. So, um, as we said, we definitely don't want you to make sweeping generalizations. Um, I, you know, I, I remember uh, my mom used to say, what you say about somebody else says more about you than it does about that person, um, which is very true. And I think a lot of times it's inadvertent um, whenever we do that, whenever we write something that's, that's not quite right um, or, or respectful. And so that's what we want to do is convey. Uh, some words and phrases don't recognize kind of the broad range of capabilities and we want to be mindful of that also. And um, when we're talking about person-first language, uh, we want to avoid those generic labels. Um, we want to emphasize abilities, uh, not necessarily the, the limitations, if you will. Um, it's exciting because we see a lot of this now in public policy. Uh, we see a lot of this written into law. Um, where you start to see person first language. Mm -hmm. um, it avoids those youth, use, how do you say that word? Euphemism. That word, yeah. yes. Um, that are condescending. Um, so, you know, some of these things like um, so and so was blind as a bat. Now, okay, what does that even mean? And mm -hmm. I don't know, I've never met a bat, so I don't know. Um, and I think they probably are okay. <laughs> so, um, it avoids implying, you know, that, that whole thing of saying, you're identifying your experience. Um, I've actually had people tell me that uh, their disability was the best thing that ever happened to them because it changed the way they were living. And I think that's very interesting. So I don't think I should be the one saying, oh, you know, you're a victim of AIDS or you're a victim of a stroke or you're a victim of any number of things. Um, I have had people say, Carolyn suffers from dyslexia. And I got to tell you, um, I don't feel like I always suffer from dyslexia. I feel like my staff suffers from my dyslexia. Yeah. I feel like my Not partner sure. suffers uh -huh. from my dyslexia. And the federal government might <laughs> suffer from my dyslexia, but not necessarily me. Um, so value-laden language, it really promotes distance, it stereotypes, and it pigeonholes. Um, and it absolutely reduces a sense of one's self-worth, power, and their self-direction. And we've got a bunch of um, examples um, coming up. And, and you know, value-laden language, when it talks about um, just the idea of it reflecting more of who um, the words that you're, you know, you're saying were your core values, it creates these categories of we versus they, good versus bad, um, strong versus weak, as far as expectation, high versus low, sick versus well, superior versus inferior, um, basically people with disabilities and people without disabilities. Um, it emphasizes abilities, not limitations. Um, so when talking or writing about people with disabilities, show them as active participants in society. Um, this is just another stat up there that says, of those people with disabilities between the ages of 21 and 64, um, and this is from 2005, 49% were actively employed. Um, we want to see the number come up, but that's just telling to show you that when we are talking about people with disabilities, oftentimes people will say, well, they want to be at home, or they're really sad and bitter, or I think they just don't want to work. Um, you know, that's a big number to say that about folks that are actively out there, you know, having careers and, you know, working. Um, and then here's just some language, some words that we, um, unfortunately, Carolyn and I and our team and my family and friends, we hear these so often, it's not even funny how often we mm -hmm. hear it, but Words like abnormal, what is that? I have no idea. I don't even know what the definition of normal is. Um, afflicted, <laughs> burden, defect, deformity, maimed, palsied, spastic, um, stricken with, um, sufferer, Carolyn mentioned that, um, victim. Oftentimes people will you know, tell me that you know, I'm a victim of my physical disability. Um, or the last word, um, oftentimes people will say invalid, um, but to be honest, when I look at it, I automatically my brain is thinking invalid. Um, so again, these are just words that, you know, they really promote distance amongst folks, um, you know, between folks with and without disabilities. So we wanted to ask you all, um, what does the word handicap mean? Um, if you all are wanting to type it into the chat area, please go ahead and interact with us. Um, but, you know, thinking about just the origin of that word handicap, um, what does it mean? And how many of you out there um, you know, just know the origin of it. We know it's a, a common term. We see it often on 
parking signs, bathroom doors, um, you know, welcome, you know, signs for um, entrances into, you know, different facili facilities. So the truth is, is that the word handicapped is an archaic term. Um, we love that it's no longer used in any federal legislation. Um, the legendary origin of the H word, if you will, refers to a person with a disability begging with his cap in his hand, with their cap in their hand. So that's what the word handicap means. So when somebody is saying, here is the handicap restroom, here's the handicap entrance, they're really saying, here's the beggar bathroom, here's the beggar entrance. Um, so it's a word that we really um, try to stay away from. And if you are you know, paying attention to conversation in the disability community, you'll notice that that word is really um, kind of a rare thing now. Um, it pops up, but we are moving away from it, which is really great. Um, so example one, evaluating language. We told you we were going to give examples of disability negative, which is on the left-hand side and disability neutral on the right hand side. So we want to move from the negative to neutral um, terminology. So things like the disabled, the blind, the deaf, um, you know, referring to folks as people with disabilities or the disability community. Um, Cripple suffers from, afflicted with, um, the person has a disability or the person is a person with a disability. Um, impairment, impaired, again, has a disability, um, or even normal person, healthy, um, wheelchair-bound, um, non-disabled person without a disability, um, person who uses a wheelchair. Um, people always tell me all the time that they're so sorry that I'm wheelchair-bound all the time or I'm confined to my wheelchair, which kind of makes me laugh a little bit because I get out of my chair and I lay in bed and I sit on the couch and um, do all sorts of things. I love to go swimming and get out of my chair, it feels good. So I don't feel bound to it. It's a great piece of technology that helps me get around, but it's not um, it's not a curse. It's not a horrible B-rated horror movie or something like that. So. And what's um, interesting yeah. also about that, mm -hmm. that whole concept of wheelchair bound, um, and is that uh, my son actually tells folks that Liz <laughs> is the fastest person he knows, which is true. Yes, <laughs> it is very true. It is, <laughs> yes, you're, you're very fast. <laughs> Um, so again, disabled parking, uh, moving towards accessible parking, accessible entrance. Um, again, we talked about the words impaired, um, impairment, um, you know, just saying folks who are deaf or folks who are hard of hearing or folks who are deaf blind. Um, low vision um, is more appropriate than visually impaired or visual impairment. Um, dumb and mute, believe it or not, I hear this one still and it's, it's, I think this is one that surprises me when I hear it every time because I'm like, are you really still saying these words? But again, it's person who has a speech or communication disability um, or even person with cerebral palsy. Um, you know, down here at the bottom, we've got CP, victim, spastic, epileptic, fit attack. Um, again, person that, you know, has seizures or somebody that has epilepsy. Um, again, if you must refer to folks, you know, in a way of having to refer to their disability. Um, people with mental health issues, um, you know, that is definitely, and I, I'm sorry, I think I've got this one backwards. So we're paying attention here on this one Ooh. to the first one, and the negative is on the right-hand side. Sorry We will definitely one. change Yes, that. we will change it before we post it online. But we want to stick with, again, people first language. So people with mental health issues, we don't want to say things like, you know, crazy lunatic, insane nuts. Um, the truth is, is that, you know, within the disability community, um, people with mental health, um, you know, issues are the largest minority. Um, and we are working really hard to outreach to those folks, um, you know, to provide more supports there. But um, there has been that gap in service to those individuals. I and mean, we never know who you're talking to on the other end of the phone, who's sitting next to you at a restaurant. So being mindful of things like that. I'm developmentally disabled, developmentally delayed, that's definitely more appropriate than saying retard or um, imbecile or Downs person or mongoloid um, or slow learner, um, things like that. Has a learning disability, um, person with a specific learning disability, those are all appropriate um, terms. And then again, um, at the bottom, person of small stature, short stature, or little person would replace 
dwarf, or midget. And we'll switch this again when we um, post it online. So um, now we're back to the way it's supposed to be, negative on the left, moving towards neutral on the right. So paraplegic, quadriplegic, that's its, it's a common um, terminology. Um, people say para or quad or something like that. But again, man with paraplegia, woman who's paralyzed, person with a spinal cord injury, a birth defect, um, congenital disability, a person with a disability from birth, um, polio, suffered from polio, person who had polio, um, homebound, um, oftentimes people are get identified as that and that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean they're stuck at home. It may be that they have some difficulty with transportation or maybe they work from home a few hours you know, throughout the week, but again, just person who stays at home or hard for the person to get out. So again, we're looking at person first language when we're thinking about all these examples. Um, just wanted to clarify here too, uh, one of uh, the folks that I was working with who does research was asking me, they're like, oh, so I shouldn't use the term quadriplegic. And I'm like, no, you can use the term quadriplegic, absolutely. If you're doing research on quadriplegia, uh -huh. yeah, you would use that term. But when you refer to individuals, you wouldn't say, oh, and here's a quadriplegic that I interviewed and you know, I interviewed five quads or anything like that. It would be, you know, the people with quadriplegic that I interviewed or, you know, the person with quadriplegic, you know, quadriplegia. So thinking about it from that perspective um, and, and just use them appropriately. We know that, you know, this is the simple thing, um, that person first language puts the person before the disability. So person and then the disability. Carolyn with whatever. Liz with whatever. Um, person, you know, with whatever, and just think about that. It describes, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, you're not using that um, to describe the person's, you know, disability first and then them. So paying attention to that describes who a person is, not what a person has, uh, and that's a very important thing. Um, I wanted to let you know that really a change in language can change everything, and I've seen this manifest time and time again that our actions are, you know, undeniably linked to our language. You know, our language, it's that value, the language tells kind of how we believe something and then our actions are related to that and then our actions um, affect that culture, environment, what we do, and then it becomes this cycle. And, and it's very important to, you know, be mindful of that cycle and help break it. Um, call people on it. If, you know, people are using language that's uh, not respectful, if they're saying, hey, retard, you know, um, I love when a friend of mine's in a fraternity and they started actually charging each other for, um, you know, using that term. And I thought that was great. So, yeah, you do it. Right on. Um, the, and that whole thing about the actions, I want you to think about, would you hire somebody or would you date somebody or would you want your professor to be somebody that everybody's like, oh, they're a retard or, you know, gosh, you know, they're de deaf and dumb. And, you know, all of those things really do make a difference. Um, so are we conveying respect or not? And that's really what it comes down to. And are we expressing how we really feel about a community?